Okay, so welcome. Today I've got, i um, proud to have, and, and thank you, I've got Donald, Donald Griffin here. He's a, a specialist with uh, family groups and businesses and um, has his own practice called Legacy Law. Uh, we've referred, um, introduced a lot of clients to Donald over the years, um, so I thought it'd be a great opportunity for Donald to uh, explain to, to you all some of the topical things he's seeing at the moment and some of the, the key uh, questions that clients are asking. So welcome, Donald, and thanks for being here today. Thanks, Nigel. Nice to be asked. <laughs> Good. All right. So um, what we'll start with, uh, we've got a few questions we'll go through. Um, the first one there, um, a, a key one that comes up is how do you protect your kids from their spouses? Um, yes, that is the million dollar question. Um, and we've, we're, we're hearing clients asking that a lot. Um, there's a few different um, things. I mean, obviously, uh, choose well, uh, but you can't always influence your, your children in relation to that. Um, if there is, uh, if you're helping your children buy property, uh, it's a good idea to document that help as a loan, because otherwise if the spouse and your child break up, um, if it's not a loan, it's an asset and it's there to be divided by the family court. Um, so very important that you document loans and also refresh them because um, a lot of people don't realize that loans can um, uh, go out of date and, and there's a statute of limitations. So there have been cases where people have thought, oh, I've got a loan, but actually the court have found that it was more than six years old and no interest had been sought uh, in relation to it. So effectively it was unenforceable. So they might as well not have bothered. So have, have paperwork that, that's, um, that, that is helpful uh, and keep it refreshed. Um, the other big thing is people, uh, uh, children would expect to get, uh, of your clients would expect to get an inheritance at some stage. And if um, that inheritance is uh, property or cash or assets uh, and it's transferred to a child, the family court uh, will consider that as an asset of the relationship. So your clients have an opportunity to, to wrap any inheritance that they might give a child in a trust, um, which will enable the child at least argue that the asset is not theirs only, but actually it's for uh, the child and grandchildren and future grandchildren. So they're the main things. Or, or, and then, sorry, lastly, if, if the spouse... Uh, is open to it, the best protection is to have some kind of a financial agreement, which essentially says um, that if, if the couple break up, we agree that the financial uh, results will be A, B and C. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I think it is a, a really uh, interesting, most clients sort of don't start to, they start to not really understand the risk of their own assets passing to the wrong people potentially. And obviously we all hope our, uh, our children have happy marriages, but life uh, throws curveballs at us. So uh, yeah, it's, it's really good that uh, clients understand how complex this can be and what they can do to protect, protect uh, money going to people maybe that they, uh, they don't want it to go to. Mm. Um, that's really helpful. If um, well, the thing that comes up a lot is super funds and beneficiaries um, and how that all works. Um, yeah, what do, you, what do you normally see there? What are some of the key issues you see with, with clients and their super funds and their uh, updating their beneficiaries? Sure. Um, well, what we often see is that people are not aware of what they're able to do with their superannuation. Um, if we start from younger people, when they go into the workforce, they're invited to join a super fund and there's a forms to be filled in and they need to nominate who their, their beneficiaries are if something happened to them. And if it's a young person who's not in a relationship and does not have kids, they often nominate their parents or a sibling or a friend. And they are very, people are very disappointed to find out later on that actually you're not allowed to nominate those people. Or if you do nominate them, it will be void. So, um, and of no force. So, what you need to do is nominate um, somebody who is a dependent under the superannuation rules. And that would usually be a spouse, a child, or their estate. So if they really want to give money to their mom uh, or sister or friend, none of whom are dependents, they should 
nominate their estate in the forms and then they can have a separate document being a will which says I would like my estate distributed to my mom, my sister and my friend. And that means they can get it that way. Um, so that that's a big issue. Um, another issue is uh, sometimes people will um, nominate children who are over 18 and they're not aware that um, unless you have told them, and I know you do tell your clients this, that there, if money goes from superannuation to a child who's over 18, they'll pay 17.5% tax mm. on the taxable component. Mm. Um, so there's, there's, there's ways to manage that, but people are, are sometimes disappointed. So then it might be that they nominated a child and when they signed the form, the child was under 18, but when the form is actually looked at because the person has passed away, the child might now be over 18. So it's very important to renew and, and, and to talk to you about when to uh, consider re reviewing the nominations because the, the consequences um, can change just because of the age of the child. Yeah, absolutely, good point. We often uh, see the face of clients when we explain that there's this uh, quite a large tax bill potentially and there's real shock of like, oh, I didn't think there was any deaf tax in Australia and um, there is this sort of hidden deaf tax through super um, and certainly, so I need to uh, think about it. They might have had a beneficiary statement signed 10 years ago that, as you said, the children are now over 18 and uh, could be uh, from a tax point of view. Yeah, and sorry, just on, just on that, Nigel, I mean, one way to manage that is to have a power of attorney uh, whereby your client nominates somebody they trust and, and, and that person um, could then withdraw the money before the, the, the client passed away. Okay. So if they've got some notice of it. And, and if they do that, that mm. means the money would leave superannuation and go into an account in the name of the client. Mm. So the, and if that money goes to a child who's over 18, there is no tax on that. Yeah. So there are some strategies that, that your clients might be interested in, uh, in relation to it. Yeah, that's a good idea, particularly, um, you know, if they, um, the significant money building up as they get older and um, having that power of attorney, I'm sure a lot of clients would be interested in that. Mm. All right, so we've um, covered off, um, you know, making sure we're aware of what's happening with kids and spouses and, um, and super funds. Um, another key thing is um, you've talked a little bit about so inheritances and uh, any tax savings around inheritances and um, what, are you, what are you seeing in that space? Sure, so the, the best, uh, most tax effective uh, way to deal with an inheritance is either through superannuation or um, through a testamentary trust. Um, so if I just speak about testamentary trust, essentially that means the money um, in a will uh, is directed to a person as trustee for various beneficiaries. Now, usually it's a trustee for themselves and their children uh, and sometimes other people as well. And if, if the language, that language is used, what it does is allow the a uh, person who's the trustee, who might well be the, 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 the child, to distribute the income, not just to themselves, but to other people as well. Mm. So it could, they could distribute the money to the children um, very tax effectively. So mm. with some advice from, from somebody like you. So what people don't realize is that children, uh, even if they're newly born, can can earn uh, twenty thousand or so dollars every year, uh, tax free. So that could go towards paying private school fees or household expenses or holidays, etc. Uh, whereas if the money just came directly to the child, they have to tell the taxman that all of that income should go into their tax return. So what we're, by using trusts, we're able to perfectly legally split the income among a number of different taxpayers and overall the family might pay a lot less tax. Hmm. So it's sort of, um, you know, it's controlling a bit from the grave, but, um, but uh, I mean, a lot of um, clients, it is a key goal of theirs to look after often the, the next generation down. So their, their kids, they say, look, they're okay, but I'd really like to set up something perhaps for their grandchildren. Is that, can that be done through a testamentary trust as well? Yeah, absolutely. And um, it, it, it does not have to be ruling from the grave as well, because usually these are discretionary trusts. Mm. So the actual child 
um, who's the, the first person to receive the money, they could say, I, I don't want to use that trust and I'm going to wind it up or I'm going to distribute it all to myself anyway. So, um, yeah, I think it, it, it gives more flexibility. It also uh, gives some protection if, if one of the, the beneficiaries was being sued and the assets could have more of a chance of being protected uh, rather than just being in that person's name. Yeah, that's great. That's, um, that's really helpful. Um, now another question that always comes up is uh, executors and um, really, you know, who should be the executor? Um, what role do they play? Um, what's, what's your opinion on, on that? Uh, it's a very good question and everybody needs to choose executors that suit them. Um, so there's no one size fits all. Uh, usually a husband and wife or two pe people in a partnership would, would appoint each other as the executor on their own. Um, but they cannot appoint a, a trusted friend or a professional such as an accountant or a lawyer. Um, uh, I'm not sure if your license allows you to be an executor. Do you have views on yeah, that? We're allowed to be. We, we don't mind being executor. Um, okay. It's, it's been good. We are for a few um, because I've got my own license, but, um, but often you know, we do find people use family members first. We're, we're happy to be appointed if, if they have someone, if they don't have anyone else they could really trust. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's great that you can offer that. Mm -hmm. um, so your role could either be as an advisor to the executor or be formally named as an executor. Mm -hmm. um, it might be helpful for people who have a second relationship, i.e. children from a previous relationship, who, um, who if, you simply, if the person simply nominated their current spouse, the, the children might be a little bit worried. So to have a, a, an independent person uh, as executor um, can be helpful in that situation. Um, mm. It has to be somebody you trust. Um, uh, there are cases of lawyers and accountants uh, going, as we say, rogue. Um, and that can mean when they become the executor of the estate, they can um, insist on uh, outrageous fees and can be very slow and um, it can, can be a problem. But if there's somebody you trust, it can, it can work very well. And um, then people would say, well, apart from my spouse, maybe the next level down would be, it should be my kids. And um, sometimes they'll nominate the eldest child. We always point out that it's a good idea to have appoint all of the children if you can. And um, as long as there's, you know, not, not 10 of them, um, two or three is a manageable number. Four is starting to get a little bit unmanageable because all of these people need to be consulted and sometimes all to sign documents. Mm. Um, so I would probably not recommend it be an eldest child or one child only. Mm. If you're going to pick a, a child, try and pick them all. Mm. And if there's any um, possibility of the kids not working well together, maybe appoint somebody independent, a, a, an uncle, a brother, a sister, or a professional just to be the referee essentially. Yeah. Okay. I also recommend if you're picking somebody who's not a beneficiary to uh, make a gift to them in lieu of what we call commission. Okay. So it's, it's a very nice gesture. They, they don't expect it. Um, it's a thankless task. They might have to come to meetings, come to your office, my office, hmm. sign forms. So uh, to make a gift to that person um, is always a nice uh, idea because you can name somebody as an executor, but at the time they could say, well, frankly, I can't do it or I don't want to do it. So whoever you pick, it's a good idea that you uh, seek their agreement um, and um, beforehand, because otherwise you, you have to come and do it again. Yeah, good point. Yeah, okay. Worth noting. Um, another thing that comes up is obviously uh, contesting a will and, um, you know, what, what can clients do to avoid, you know, um, well, the chance of someone contesting their will? Mm. Well, the law does allow a, quite a broad range of people to challenge a will. And again, I find clients um, like you, I, when I see their face, they, they, they really can't believe it. They say things like, well, surely it's my money. I can do with, with it what I want. Mm. And while that's true initially, that doesn't stop somebody challenging the will. So, um, the best things to do are to anticipate what types of claims people might want to bring. So if you're thinking of leaving somebody out of a will who would probably expect to get something, you need to manage that expectation. Hmm. Um, 
if possible, you communicate with them. Um, but again, the, the, the tension between the, in the relationship might be such that they just say, look, I haven't spoken to that person for a long time. Um, it's important to get some legal advice because if that person's left out, they could challenge it. And what that means is they're then suing your executor. And there's a fight that might have been just bubbling under the surface will be brought to the surface. And um, fights about wills are like divorces. Um, uh, only they can be a bit more extreme because um, they're not hurting the feelings of the person who's died because they're not around. Mm -hmm. um, so we would recommend, uh, sometimes we know there will be blood because uh, mom or dad has said simply I do not want that person to get anything um, my advice would be to say well let's prepare for litigation um, uh, in a couple of ways one would be to at least get mom and dad's very calm wording and explanation as to why they're not leaving anything to that person let's get that down in writing and let's get it signed by mom and dad uh, you have to be careful about what you say because if you say things like I'm I'm not leaving uh, John anything because he's um, he's a violent uh, uh, a cheat and he's totally untrustworthy. Um, John, when he sees that piece of paper, can then get his barrister to quite eloquently maybe show that the client was being a bit uh, dramatic or um, a, was not being factual and was frankly wrong and was operating operating under some kind of a delusion. So you need to pick words very carefully, more more properly uh, explaining uh, not not what you think of the person, but uh, linking it to the law, which which would be to say how you've already provided for that person, mm. say how your relationship with that person is such that they should not would not normally be considered. Um, somebody who could get something from your estate. So that might be somebody you're estranged from uh, and you would need to, to set out calmly the circumstances and how long you've not spoken for them and attempts to maybe reconcile and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and then lastly, sometimes it's a good idea, even though clients don't like it, to give a small amount to that person who they don't really want to give anything to. That puts the pressure on that person to show that actually they're entitled to more than that. If they've been left out, it's much easier to show that you should have got more than zero. But if you've been left $50,000 and you don't have a close relationship with somebody, the, the, the person who's got the 50,000, their lawyer will be saying to them, well, look, you know, you realize you might not get more than 50,000 hmm. in court. A, a, a judge might well feel that because of the explanation left by the deceased that Frankly, that's 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 um, more than you should be entitled to. And if you're if you don't get more, then you might have to pay the costs of everybody involved. So strategically, it's a very good idea uh, to offer up a, a certain amount, a nominal amount, uh, which will put pressure on that person. It will make them think twice about whether they should bring a claim against the estate. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. That's really interesting. Right. All right. Well, um, obviously, um, you're a specialist in this field, and we certainly think that uh, clients need specialist advice. It's such a minefield. What do you see as um, some of the key things for clients when they're looking for a, uh, to engage a lawyer? Um, what are some of the things they should be looking for or, or asking? Um, well, Nigel, we say to our clients, we are interested in having a relationship, not a transaction. So the first point, and point is you, you want somebody who may be around in the future to to assist interpret what, what was meant when the document was signed. Mm. Uh, so we do litigation in this area and our business is growing and, and we've got younger lawyers coming through. So we say that we can, we can help with that. Um, the other thing is to have somebody that you can, uh, who, who does quite a lot of this, this work because you learn a lot um, from uh, dealing with tricky matters and you can bring that into other 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 cases. So we learn from other clients and um, Experience is good and bad uh, So it's important I think to to have 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 a lawyer who does understand this area and will be around in the future and the family can 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 work with um, So we're, we're really keen to meet the beneficiaries in advance and um, 
and that can we can explain that strategy about the power of attorney that we discussed earlier we can explain who's going to be the executor we can explain broadly the division of assets and if everybody agrees that that seems an appropriate course of action that helps us deal with any changes of 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 of, of mind by those people later on so for instance if they say well i'm not happy with my brother being the executor well if you or I are at the meeting, a family meeting, um, the, the client can have peace of mind that there's, there, are, there were witnesses. It's not just a document signed by one person put in a drawer, which everybody can interpret. We can have a, an agreed understanding of what the, the thrust of the document is. And, and you or I, uh, or the beneficiaries can say, well, frankly, um, you know, the person who's disappointed should, should have spoken up earlier on. And then mom or dad could have done something differently. So I think technically you need somebody strong uh, relationship wise, somebody who you can deal with. Um, and we also offer fixed fees in relation to this because we do a lot of it. So we're able to say, oh, okay, given a certain scenario, the fees will be X. And um, if you're going to a lawyer, always ask what the fees um, are likely to be up front. Um, and you need to compare apples with apples um, in terms of, um, you know, what, what services have been provided. Um, I might just show you a couple of things very quickly, um, which maybe differentiate us a little bit. Uh, for people who've got young children, I'd recommend that they leave some information such as that. Yeah. Um, it's a guardian's manual, and within that they can spell out what they want for the children's education, mm -hmm. uh, wishes, values, what they would like their guardian to do. And then for other people, it's a good idea to leave other information as well. So um, we've got um, prompters in these documents, which will make it a lot more personal um, and give the, the, the client peace of mind that it's their language, it's their, uh, their it's been specifically tailored for their family. So uh, the, there's different ways to do it. Um, but we, we, we certainly suggest that more information is, is helpful. Fantastic, brilliant. Um, Look, Donald, um, we're, uh, we're lucky to be able to lean on you as, a, as an expert in this field for uh, our, um, our, our own knowledge in the practice, but obviously the clients that we're able to uh, that need help. Um, so really thank you for your time today. I know there's a lot more um, you could talk about, but the key thing is for us at Arch Capital, um, thanks so much. Um, we'll obviously share your contact details if you're okay with that and we'll, um, as we send this out. Um, and, um, and again, thanks so much for your time. And for our clients that are listening, um, we highly recommend that um, we, if you want, have any questions, you, you reach out and, um, of course, we can introduce you to, to Donald and his team. So, um, again, thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll cut off the recording now and uh, okay. we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye.